without a doubt one of the best ways to level up your game as a security researcher and get better at uncovering niche vulnerabilities and even just get better at understanding new code faster is to watch other security researchers and understand exactly what their approach is and get to sort of see exactly what they're thinking and how they're approaching new functions, new contracts, and new systems entirely. But of course, it could be hard to get to look over the, the shoulder of some fellow security researchers. So of course, that's why I decided to do this series where I live audit alongside Dennis, who is a research engineer from Protocol Labs, their hierarchical consensus implementation in Solidity. And essentially in this series, you have all the context that I have. We go through this the system overview from the beginning to the end of the entire review live in front of you. And we uncover every single bug live along the way. And now today, this is the final episode. So we've come a very long way. And if you've followed the series to this point, I hope that you've gotten a tremendous amount of value from it. I hope that you've seen some things that maybe you wanna add into your approach and maybe picked up a few ways of thinking, a few heuristics for uncovering vulnerabilities in other code bases from watching this series. All right, but of course, before we dive into this final episode here, my name is Owen and over a year and a half ago, I founded Guardian Audits. And since then we've uncovered easily over a hundred critical and high vulnerabilities from auditing hundreds and hundreds of smart contracts. And at this point, I've personally spent easily around 2000 hours or so auditing smart contracts. And my goal with all of the videos that I put out and especially this series is to distill down everything that I've experienced from over those 2000 hours and give them to you so that you can ultimately become a much, much better security engineer in a fraction of the time. All right, now without further ado, let's get into the final episode. In today's session, we are auditing apply messages, uh, propagate, white list propagator, maybe other functions we have not uh, audited so far, right? So where should we start? Yeah, so I think apply messages should give context for it all, right? Because that's where we put it into the post box or apply it or stuff like that, right? Yeah, so that's in internal function, right? Yeah, so apply Actually, I believe we have audited it because so my messages is called in commit child check and uh, in in submit up down checkpoint in submit up down checkpoint and the play messages is just a loop where we go through all cross messages and apply them one by one right so, uh, so this is interesting the first thing i'm wondering is okay so we're applying all of these messages in a loop i hope we have like try catch logic or something like that in case one of the messages reverts or something like that because if one of them will revert then all of them will revert right mm -hmm. and a forwarder we have a forwarder here commit source no questions here right so opt optimizations minor optimizations mm -hmm. nothing interesting yep yeah. and here we can we can see that we can revert yeah and so that that means that if we have a message with a uh, zero address mm -hmm. then we can implement then an attacker can implement a denial of service attack if yeah if, yeah exactly message will be added into that batch message and so does that mean that can the batch be updated to not have that or is it now just kind of stuck so if we so let's if the two field is zero then we revert we revert to apply messages mm -hmm. and that's it i mean nothing nothing happens yeah so when we revert apply messages we always apply messages with like the the messages from whatever the latest like collection of messages is at the the checkpoint right uh, commit child check. yeah and so that has a commit which has all of these messages right mm -hmm. the commit dot cross messages i yes. assume yes. since that's like voted on and collected over a period if one bad message gets in there then is the whole commit just kind of like jammed like dos yeah probably, <laughs> probably. yeah 
Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's probably that, that, that's a really big issue then. So yeah, and I wonder if the the best fix for this is in the apply messages loop, if you just wrap these in like a try catch or something like that. Uh, and then maybe you would append it to like a failed messages list or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, and then of course, so if you were to wrap it in a try catch, we'd have to make that apply message function an external function and then make an external call to this contract. And then you'd have to have some special authentication for that. But yeah, or you could like delegate call or something like this. But And uh, what is the approach to fix it? Try catch or what? Yeah, so we can, I don't know exactly how you guys would want to fix this, but my first guess would be that apply message function. We want to wrap it in a try catch. And then we would have to make it an external function to be able to like wrap it in a try catch and actually catch those uh, transaction wide errors. Mm -hmm. How's it going, Alfonso? Hello, folks. Sorry for the delay. No worries, no worries at all. Yeah, so now maybe Alfonso can fix it from design perspective. Maybe we don't need to fix it in the code. So the the issue we found is that if so when we apply messages in a cross we are aware of that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if one is wrong, it it there's a denial of service attack because yeah. like it completely stopped. Uh, this is a design problem that we need to fix. Right now, what we're saying is that you mess up with your subnet, it's up to you. Like validators should worry about avoiding this from happening when they orchestrate, um, I mean, when they tailor their checkpoint, but this is really weak. So we need to improve this. Mm -hmm. either discarding messages. I mean, if you have any suggestion, that would be great. But like, this was the easiest thing to, to do in a, in an MVP state, but it's definitely a, an issue. It's yeah, the, the first thing that came to my mind is just to make that apply message function an external function, and then you can try catch around it and catch those. And then of course, don't allow anybody else to call the external function, but yeah. Yeah, there's an, so this apply message is triggered once a checkpoint is accepted as valid, which means that you need a multi-signature from a majority of the of the validators. So just calling it externally, I mean, you cannot call, call it externally actually, because that would mean you would need to collect a multi-sig from, well, maybe you can, now that you, because once you have well, I mean, it, the checkpoint. Yeah, it would be, it would be uh, functionally the same as what's going on here. The only reason I say to make it external is because for a try catch to work in solidity, it has to call an external function. You can't like wrap an internal function. You can also do like some stuff with delegate call, but yeah, just, I mean, you can make it an external function and then require that only this address is able to call it. So it's like the contract externally calling itself. And that's kind of like a hacky way to get try catch to actually work for something like this. Yeah, it's a good search. Thanks. So uh, is that reported or not? I mean, it is reported. I can share the issue. Remind me okay. after the call and I will share the issue because this yeah, it's a long known mm. issue. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. The sign that. Okay. And uh, so here we several checks. And then, yeah, we looked at this function on the previous session, in the previous session, right? And we decided that it's, uh, it's a very good candidate for fuzzing and for thorough auditing. Yeah, I think it was either this one or there was another function that used that apply type. I believe it, it's this one. Yeah, definitely. I remember it was if, actually, no, I think it was a different function because I remember there was logic where the apply type could be bottom up, but then we had a Boolean that's called should execute bottom up or should commit bottom up. And then that's what actually decided if we were going to commit bottom up. Oh, maybe, yeah. And then, yeah, so there's some edge cases to, to go into there for sure. But I think that's what we were looking at before. But yeah, we're familiar with this, this apply type because we were looking into it last time. Uh, again, here we use balance and we reported that it's not a good idea to use balance and that was already fixed. Mm -hmm. New version, but let's verify. Okay, so yeah. you split it into cases I'm seeing here where we see if the cross message needs to be applied to this, this subnet versus if it needs to go to, on, to a post box to be propagated later. Mm -hmm. So it's if it's a bottom-up message, we get a subnet. Yeah, and forwarder is empty. Forwarder is a, a second argument. Is a forwarder like that's the person paying the gas fees or something like this? So in the, the forwarder, uh, it's the subnet that it's forwarding the message. And the reason right. for this is to figure out where the fees should go. If I recall correctly, I will have to mm -hmm. double check. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, actually, 
I would have to check this one. I, I don't remember if it's to double check it where where the fee should go or to determine if you should because like what you do when you're propagating a message is that you get to the common parent. So so you may have a bottom up message that needs to be propagated top down because like if you get to the common parent, then there's no more going up and you need to propagate um, the message down. So that's the way in which we know what direction got it, got should it. the message go. Yeah, I, that's the yeah, subnet ID forwarded. That's the reason for this. Like you need to know who's propagating, like what is the subnet that is propagating this message in order to know if you're already in the common parent or, and you need to keep going up or not. Got it. That so so that's, that's why even if you have a bottom up type, sometimes you may have to commit it as a top down because it means like, hey, uh, the the subnet that this is is going to it's actually in a lower level instead of like in an upper level which means that it's in some other branch and it needs to go down once the common parent is reached got it so i assume that's why we saw the logic earlier when we were looking at okay this thing is bottom up but then it could be bottom up but you would end up actually committing top down in some cases yeah it makes sense okay yeah what what if the forwarder is empty there is no else or nothing so we just do we do not do this and is that final function yeah we just execute it i would have to read the whole i don't remember why we're doing this honestly um yeah it seems like the only effect is the nonce oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay I, I yeah that's the reason like if the forwarder is empty it means that it's directed potentially to these no it's not that one yeah yeah so the if the forwarder is empty it means that it needs to be executed in this subnet and that's why you execute it and include the like increase the top down message sorry the the nonce if not you it means that it's from the post box and you just need to propagate it further without actually executing it here but take me with a grain of salt because i don't remember <laughs> it was a while yeah i think what i'm most interested in here is uh the cross message dot execute and specifically interested in like what kind of gas griefing protections do you guys have on on that execution okay i'm not sure are you guys i know you're using like some file coin library for addresses i'm not sure if they have any sort of like gas stipend hard coded but i'm assuming that they just forward all the gas in the transaction so i'm thinking that might be another thing to look out for is if Let's say I were to send a cross message to another subnet and on that subnet, I have a contract that is sitting at the address that this message is supposed to interact with. And that contract just has a while true loop. And so if we forward all the gas, we'll only end up forwarding, at least if you're, you, you know, if we're using like the EVM, we'll, you'll end up forwarding 63 out of 64 of the, the current transaction gas. And then that contract will use 63 out of 64 of the current transaction gas. Then you come back to this loop that we're in where we're executing cross messages and we only have one sixty-fourth of the original gas which will likely you know not be enough to to finish executing stuff or can't be enough to be enough while fitting within the block gas limit if that makes sense mm -hmm. That contract, what do you mean by that contract? Yeah, so like if we, like for instance, let's say if I just made a function call that didn't send any value or anything like that, we're just making a function call like this this data on line 90, 95, where we're like encoding with selector. So let's say I have a message on a contract at address A and the function selector is, you know, method foo, right? So I make a cross message that invokes method foo on contract at address A. And so then we'll ultimately end up on line 101 function calling address A with, you know, we're calling foo on address A, but little do we know when we're executing, we're trying to execute this bash of cross messages that function foo is just a infinite loop, right? So it just spends all the gas that you send to it. I thought you meant a routing contract, not endpoint. So yeah, yeah, like like an arbitrary contract. Mm -hmm. Alfonso, but uh, what, what do you do in Rust in that case? In so I, th I, th I think we have the same problem because here we're just forwarding the message. And uh, we, so the thing is that, and actually that's another design that issue that we have is that currently the one that submits the checkpoint is the one that pays for the gas. So the idea that we have is that I submitted the checkpoint as a validator, I'm the last one. So they trigger the execution, I pay for the gas, and I like the VM will reimburse the execution of that gas. But that doesn't prevent while we are subsidizing the, the <laughs> submission, that doesn't yeah. with the fees that we have collected from CrossNet messages, that doesn't fix the the gas craving attack. And I don't really know a good way of fixing this 
generally. I don't know if you have any suggestion. Yeah, it is it is hard because ideally you want to allow people... Well, what you could do is when somebody submits a cross message in like create cross message, I forget what the function is called. You just require them to pay a fee that corresponds to how much gas they say that they want to use. And then that way, you know, then on each cross message, I assume we'll have to add like a field in the struct that's like gas stipend. And then you can use the gas stipend as a limit for how much you're going to be forwarding. And then we also make sure that they're actually paying for the full stipend somehow okay that's non-trivial because then you have to worry about you know gas costs on you know what if this the gas cost spikes and stuff like that so it's definitely non-trivial but that's a start <laughs> that's yeah, yeah that's the original design that we had in the mvp uh -huh. but then it was really hard to to predict like we didn't ux wise it was hard mm -hmm. to let users like because we're back to the first auction problem. I could like front run you with, with trying to improve, like to increase the fee and so on. So something that we also thought about is instead of gas cost, uh, have it in units of gas, like have the actual unit of gas, but that mm -hmm. means that we need a pre-execution of those messages. So yeah. if there's some more of an off-chain, uh, so you cannot do everything on-chain, you need to actually like have some kind of off-chain Cisco or hook that allows you to predict, or at least to pre-execute how much gas the message execution will require. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like you could have like a max and say like you have to like escrow this much money and that's like the max that you could pay in gas and then we'll end up only taking a fraction of that. But like, yeah, UX is very hard for this problem. <laughs> yeah, maybe account abstraction would make it better eventually. But yeah, as it hasn't been deployed, we haven't spent much time. So we're just tracking this as an issue and figure out with the community how we can mm -hmm. make it better without like penalizing all of the UX, which is already too, it's not great <laughs> right now. It's too technical. Uh, so what should we note here? Yeah, I guess I would just say... vulnerable to gas griefing attacks. Yeah, yeah, that summarizes it perfectly. Uh, uh, that's not, is it uh, not similar? VIP suggestion you described with the guy in the paper. Does it help? Uh, it doesn't. You have the same issue. Oh. So you're you're pre-allocating how much gas you're going to pay for your message. And if you run out of it, what you do is like you leave it in the post box and some, someone has to come and pay for it. That's kind of the VIP post box that we're thinking of. It's like, we're going to leave all of the, the subnets to handle the message for me, but you need to pre-allocate all the gas. If you run out of gas, it will just get stuck in the where it wasn't applied in the subnet where it wasn't able to be applied. And then you have to pay if you want to propagate it further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, of course, the other thing is going to be, of course, your entrancy if we're calling other contracts. But I know you guys use on your entrant on virtually all the functions. But uh, if we go back to where this dot execute is called i just want to get an idea of if there's anything that's like outdated at the time okay yeah so that's right before we would return here so then this i know this function is called in a loop that's somewhat interesting actually because you would be giving okay so potentially giving someone control over the transaction execution before all these other messages in the uh in the commit have been applied i think that should be fine as long as there's nothing interesting that i can re-enter onto the gateway or even yeah i don't think the yeah it's not like the subnet actor would have anything interesting to re-enter into it's, it's worth noting that even if you use like a non reentrant on the gateway here i can still re-enter into like other contracts that are like tangentially a part of the system. So like the subnet actor, I could re-enter into the subnet actor and do stuff there, but that's not going to affect anything for this subnet, right? But it is plugged into the gateway. Can you note that down, Dennis? I think we should double check that one. We didn't think about that one, like having, so if one of these apply messages actually enters some other subnet actor, you cannot enter the same because it's, yeah, it's not a subnet, but, but it can enter as some subnet actor that eventually gets into the gateway in mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. And that can be dangerous. So we didn't think about that one. Yeah. But I mean, so if every single external and public function on the gateway are non reentrant then it should be fine. Because even if you re-enter the subnet actor and then the subnet actor calls an external function on the gateway, that will still fail. But There's no loop possible, but yeah, yeah. But yeah, non -re non -re is a fix for like single contract instances, but it just gets carry with like multiple contracts and stuff like that. So it's just a lot to, to check. And so what should I note exactly here? So maybe check that um 
reentrance from gateway to some subnet actor doesn't have unexpected side effects. I'm not saying an attack, but at least not on an unexpected side. Effect. Correct. That's fine. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think from what I can think of, that's all the nasty things that an arbitrary cross message could do. I don't think you, you guys aren't like expecting any return data or stuff like that. So that's fine. But yeah, if there was like, if you're getting like revert messages or expecting any return data, that could be another thing where they could return really large data that could also gas grief you, even if you gave them a gas stipend. But uh, speaking about reentrancy, here we changed the state after we call execute yeah but we we return after the execute right so so that state is yeah so here oh, okay, yeah, sure. yeah yeah we only do that mm -hmm. if you're not in the post box yeah all okay all right yeah so that's if the message executes that's all the the nasty things i can think of off the top of my head but so that then we go into the post box correct if, mm -hmm. if it's not for this subnet propagate right so we have two functions related to post box propagate and whitelist propagate correct we shouldn't look a lot into the whitelist propagator because we're going to change the current approach. So before we had an approach where the only the owner of the message, so the one that triggered the message externally, is the one that should pay for, like, that is allowed to pay for the gas unless we say otherwise. And we're going to change instead of an opt-in and opt-out approach. Where, right. Because, like, it made no sense. I mean, if someone wants to pay for my gas or a, a service wants to subsidize my gas propagation for whatever service they're building, it's easier if we do it the other way around. So I don't think whitelist propagation propagator makes sense because we're going to do it the other way around if we can. Got it. So Go white, without, like, reviewing this. whitelist becomes a blacklist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, that's the thing. <laughs> okay, great. And could we look at has fee again just one more time? I know we've looked at it a few times, but I forgot it. Okay. Yeah, it just has to be... So that's interesting. It could be more than the cross message fee so it should be refunding and we are got it we commit cross message get the message commit this message run cross message side effects that's interesting actually that the so the side effects happen before you delete it from the post box and it also looks like this function is not non-reentrant so i'm wondering if there's some way to re-enter and like propagate things twice like this so if we if we go into cross message side effects i know this distributes rewards in some cases at least yes yeah, so in the in the actor i don't remember but when we distribute rewards i think on this commit that we we're looking at we were pushing it to people right and it's an ether mm -hmm. yeah so i think actually so on on that line 497 in the gateway we can in some cases at least hand over transaction control over to like an arbitrary address that is somebody who's getting a reward distribution, but this message CID is still in the post box at that time. So I think it, it might be possible to you still get that same cross message. So you, you could propagate it multiple times, I'm thinking. Yeah, maybe it would be safer to just move delete before. Yeah, yeah. Clearing the set effects is that way, like it's a cheap way of just yeah, preventing that's, that if that's, that's possible. It, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And then I guess since this function is non reentrant oh well i guess okay it will never be in the post box if we're executing it i was just thinking of you know during trend uh message execute if i could re-enter the gateway into the propagate function and do something there but you would only be able to propagate stuff that had been put in the post box which is presumably unrelated to whatever is being executed. somewhere else yeah, yeah. so that would be fine yeah unless you i don't know to what extent you can orchestrate an attack where you put something in the post box and then try to trigger from some other subnet. Mm -hmm. It's quite twisted, but maybe that's something we should think of. Maybe. I, I think as far as I can see on the, the message execution, though, it should be fine. Don't, we don't need uh, non reentry modifiers here or in cross-message effect, do we? Yeah, so if, if you did move the, the delete up, then yeah. that should be fine. You might need them for other reasons. Like, I don't know if there's an interesting way to re-enter propagate when there is something in the post box that shouldn't be in the post box. It depends. It would, we would have to go through, like, I've sort of, I tried to create like a system for uncovering all possible re-entrances. And basically the way that that works, we don't have to do it <laughs> live because it's, it's, it's actually pretty tedious, but you have to enumerate all of the external calls that could go to you know untrusted addresses and then what we have to do is enumerate 
all of the functions that they could possibly re-enter into. And then literally the only way to, you know, really fully flush out is to go through all of those different combinations and see, okay, is there an invalid state that I can exploit when I'm doing this? But yeah, really just go through all of the functions that could be called, even functions that could be called in other contracts in the system and stuff like that. Just really have to do like the the N squared algorithm to <laughs> to be sure. But yeah, I think but besides this, I believe we we looked at commit cross message earlier, right? When we were going through the creation of a cross message. Can I mean cross message? This one. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, this is the one we were you were talking about that yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to um, look into the edge cases there or fuzz tests and stuff like that. Yeah, so this is exactly where we have that should commit bottom up and it's based on the common parent. But if so, if I have a bottom up message and should commit bottom up is false, then I end up committing top down, <laughs> which is expected in those in that subset of cases. But actually, one one small detail on line 596, we have like this ternary like addition where it's like we either plus equals one or plus equals zero. I think it would be, you know, slightly cheaper if we just did like an if if apply type equals top down plus equals one and then we avoid all like the the, the add op codes and stuff like that. But yeah, beyond that, uh, Dennis, what else have we not covered in the gateway? Uh, we have not covered voting contract. We we covered it partially. I believe. Yeah, when we we're going through the gateway and the actor. Yeah, it's used in the subnet subnet actor, and we also have many uh, helpers for different types for account checkpoint and so on. Uh, yeah, uh, all issues we found here we reported, but the our contractors have not answered. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, Alfonso, maybe you can suggest or, or something we should look at. So actually, I will need to jump to my next meeting. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> but um, so actually, this the gateway is kind of the critical mm -hmm. uh, contract. And then maybe the voting. We are aware of a few issues in the voting, like the, the checkpoint submission. I don't know if you reviewed that in the first session, but like uncovering all of the things that could go wrong there would be really useful because it's, it feels like a core piece of the protocol. And at least when we were reviewing it, we were aware of a few things that could go wrong there, but maybe we we're missing some. I don't know, Dennis, if you went through that, like the voting yeah. process of, and the submission of checkpoints. If you went through that and, and you already uncovered with the ones that you mentioned, that's uh -huh. great. Those issues are a result of our review. Nice. Nice. Then like those are the critical sites. I don't think the helpers, I mean, there are, things in the helpers that could go wrong but i'm thinking like we can have used more of the of your time i will let dennis yeah yeah i think we we touched on everything sort of tangentially if it was yeah. if it was used in the gateway and stuff like that so yeah yeah it was pretty impressive i think we we got like complete coverage of the gateway and stuff like that and that is a wrap that concludes our our hierarchical consensus audit that concludes our review that concludes the series and i hope that if you've watched all the episodes up until this point you also have a really really solid understanding of this code base and you've also been able to take away a good number of things from my approach and and how we were walking through these contracts with dennis and be able to apply that to your own approach and the way that you think when you're going about a security review. And of course, last but not least, if you are part of a protocol team that is building a cool new DeFi protocol and you're starting to think about launch, you're starting to think about security reviews, then I want to hear about your project. In fact, I wanna hear about it so much that I'll go ahead and give you guys a completely free initial first pass notes on anything that might just be a glaring issue or some informational notes that ought to get fixed before going into an audit. And I'll give you these notes, of course, when you go to guardianaudits.com slash quote and fill out an application with all your project details. And we can go over these notes 
on a call and we discuss your options for a smart contract security review. And of course, if you happen to know a team that is looking for a security review and go ahead and send them to guardianaudits.com slash quote. And of course, if you're interested in deep diving on smart contract security and you want to connect with hundreds of other security researchers from around the world and get to ask questions and provide your own experience to others, then go ahead and head over to lab.guardianaudits.com and join our community of hundreds of smart contract security researchers for free. Okay, that is all for this time. I cannot wait to see you in the next one.